Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. This is the UREC team here to talk to you about getting started with our clinically integrated network accreditation program. We're really proud of this program. We have some great clients on it, and we're here to talk to you about what it means to get started. On our team today, people you'll hear from in sort of this order are Kurt Acker, who's our Director of Sales. Um, we've got Dr. Diane Sacco, she's one of our accreditation reviewers. We've got Morana Lissadecki, she is our Client Relations Manager representing that team today. We have Steve Graham, he is specifically the accreditation reviewer for Clinically Integrated Networks. We've got our President and CEO, Dr. Sean Griffin, and I'm Lisa Silverman here to facilitate and move the conversation along. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Kurt. Thank you, Lisa. Just bear with me one second here. Uh, good afternoon, all, and welcome. I'm Kurt Acker, and if you're new to UREC, I'll be your first point of contact for UREC's care management accreditation and certification programs. I've been with UREC for uh, about three and a half years now, and I have the responsibility as the business development executive in digital health accreditation, and this program falls into that. As I work with clients, I've noticed that most first time applicants have many of the same questions and apprehensions. And the team here uh, today was, was set up to answer some of those commonly asked questions. And my role today is to tell you about who we are and why we believe in accreditation. As you can see on your screen, URAC is more than 30 years old, having just celebrated our 30th anniversary. We're an independent accreditor and we do not provide consulting services. We believe that you do not need us to tell you what policies or procedures are best for you and your organization. We provide support for our clients, including educational webinars and a dedicated client relations manager to guide you through the process. We pride ourselves on keeping the accreditation process fair and completely free of bias. Our, re our reviewers, some of which you'll meet uh, during the webinar right now, are all clinicians themselves and average 20 years of experience in in the healthcare space. The majority of our reviewers have been with URAC for an, uh, at least five years, and they're experts in our programs and what makes high quality healthcare. Our clients have consistently told us they value their URAC accreditation or certification for some of the reasons that, that are posted here on the screen. The standards for our programs were developed by leading industry experts in healthcare uh, meeting these standards is something your organization uh, can certainly celebrate. URAC offers a wide variety of healthcare management accreditations and certifications. Today, we're going to specifically talk about clinically integrated network accreditation, um, but you may find that some of your providers are also interested in URAC's case management, telehealth, um, provider-based population health accreditations, or even the transitions of care designation to simply showcase the excellent work that they're doing in those areas. And my role is really designed to help you figure out which accreditation is, is right for you and your organization. What you're looking at here is a, is a small sample of our clinically integrated network clients. And in a few minutes, Steve will tell you which types of organizations are best suited to apply for URX clinically integrated network accreditation. Diane, Steve, Marnola and Sean will be sharing more about the URAC accreditation process in just a few minutes. But you can see here a brief overview of how your application is processed. After you submit your application information, your uh, URAC assigned reviewer will start a desktop review of the application, following up with a request for information if there's a need for further details around the standards. And then they'll schedule the validation review. Once the validation review is complete, your reviewer will submit your blinded application to URAC's accreditation committee for final determination. URAC's accreditation committee meets twice a month and we notify applications within 14 to 45 days of the committee's decision. Thanks, Kurt. I'm really thrilled to have a great team with us here today. Um, throughout the webinar, Steve, Diane, Morinola, and Sean are going to answer some of the commonly asked questions that we hear from our clients. Um, we hear a lot of these questions from our clients, no matter what program 
they're getting. So if you're new to Europe, many of these answers may apply to several of our programs. I say may apply um, because our trusted accreditation reviewers will say every accreditation is different. Every accreditation is um, is unique. Um, but you will see, you know, you'll hear, hear a little bit about preparing for accreditation. You'll hear about timing. Um, like I said, these answers that we're speaking to today are unique to clinically integrated networks, but if you're interested in one of our other programs, one of the ones that um, Kurt may have highlighted, something like provider-based population health or something like that, or telehealth, you think that's a great fit for you, some of these answers may apply. As I said, we're a small enough group, so you'll see the questions on the screen and you'll hear them, but please chime in with your own. Our team is ready to answer any questions you want to throw at us. And as you can see in the chat box, Nick has put in some links to our accreditation process. He's put in the link to our website. And at some point, he'll chat in the link to our clinically integrated network program. So Steve, the first question we have today is for you. Um, Steve, you're really one of our experts in this area. You have been on the clinically integrated network side of things. You are the person doing the review. So when people actually apply for clinically integrated network, you're probably one of the people with whom they'll work the most closely. Um, with that, sometimes it's a little bit weird to figure out who is best suited. So before we even think about what is the application, what do I have to do? Let's talk about who is best suited to apply for our clinically integrated network accreditation. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, first, at a high level, clinical integrated network accreditation is for an organization seeking to improve specifically healthcare outcomes as well as reducing healthcare costs. Uh, types of organizations to be included in this particular process would be account care organizations. Um, I saw um, some of the individuals that logged in earlier, uh, including specialty provider networks, uh, independent practice or provider associations such as IPAs, uh, multi specialty practice groups, as well as physician hospital organizations. Thank you, Thanks. Lisa. Thanks, Steve. Diane, you have been a reviewer who's been with URAC for a long time. I think you're over eight years with us. So you've seen a lot of clients go through. Um, what resources do you direct clients to when they want to start preparing? That's a good question, Lisa. Um, so signing the application agreement unlocks an assortment of resources, and many of those will follow you as an organization throughout your relationship with URAC. The first is the assignment of a client relations manager or a CRM. Your CRM provides continuity of contact regardless of where you are in your accreditation process. You'll also receive access to a credit net and the accreditation guide for your program. The accreditation guide is available as you prepare documentation for the desktop and the validation review phases of the accreditation. This includes the standards and elements of performance, the interpretive information, and the sections demonstrating compliance for both desktop and validation review. If you review the URAC accreditation guide and still have a question, you can find the submit an inquiry link in your application and accredit net, and it's also available on the URAC website. URAC reviewers will respond to your inquiries in writing. While URAC reviewers cannot function as your consultant, we are available to clarify standard interpretation questions that you may have as you progress through the process. The URAC website also offers applicants a catalog of webinars to choose from, ranging from detailed information about the review process and frequently asked questions. But please also visit URAC on YouTube where additional helpful videos are housed. Thanks, Diane. Diane, I'm going to throw this next question at you. Okay. So we think of submitting for accreditation, and it can be daunting. I think anybody who's been through it once, no matter with what type of organization, anybody who's applied for anything, when you're looking at something big, it, it can get a little daunting. Um, let's, let's be honest here. Let's tell our clients what is involved in submitting our application, the application for our accreditation. That's a great question. So each standard element requires your organization to upload documentation as evidence to meet the intent of that standard. And in most cases, one or two documents are sufficient to demonstrate your organization's compliance with the standard. So a policy or a procedure usually meet the intent, but in some instances, a program description, an org chart, uh, possibly meeting minutes or sample reports may be helpful or even required. As you upload documents for each standard, continue to refer to the demonstrating compliance desktop review that I referenced earlier in the accreditation guide, because that will provide the required evidence for each standard. So while you certainly plan to take 
great care to provide the documentation listed. Remember, there's an opportunity to add additional documentation during the request for information or RFI phase, which your URAC lead reviewer will discuss on the introductory communication. When uploading your documentation, uh, please include specific citations. The citations serve to direct your reviewers to exactly where your organization's policies and documents meet the intent of the standard, and that may help minimize the RFI request. Thank you, Diane. Steve, you've been one of our reviewers for just as long as Diane. I think the two of you started within a few months of each other. You've been teammates for a while. You've seen a lot of clients go through the review process. What are a couple of steps you would recommend to somebody, to an organization to prepare for the accreditation process? Um, I would say there's three, uh, three key steps in obtaining clinical integrated network accreditation. Uh, first and foremost is defining the leadership role and identifying specific goals and metrics that you're gonna be using. Uh, two would be documentation. Uh, documenting is a key for ongoing accreditation as well as current accreditation and also presenting the information. Uh, so this would include documentation process as well as outcomes. And third involves transparency. Um, how will you communicate? Um, is this looking at information um, for just an internal or are you going to be looking at external clients as well? So you need to define your specific transparency pattern and how you're going to communicate information. Uh, types of material that would be included on this transparency involve quality, costs and outcomes, uh, as well as the, the frequency that you're going to be providing during this dialogue. Steve, thanks so much. I think, you know, hopefully in understanding what all is involved in submitting and, and how to best prepare, we were able to set our clients up for success. Um, as a note, um, we have many of our standards posted on our website. They are available for sale if you want to spend a little bit more time in them. And I'll ask Nick to link to our store in there. You can see the standards um, for any of our programs. You can see our standards at a glance on our programs, but you can also um, purchase them if you're not quite ready, but you want to get more ready. We have that as an option there. Um, and if you have any questions about that, chime them into the chat box and a member of our team will get back to you about that. Warren all it's time to bring you onto the screen here. Um, you are the person who deals with the clients from right after we sign their application agreement um, until through the end. Tell us how long does somebody have to submit? Do you have that time to prepare? What happens? What's our timeline like there? So thank you, Lisa. Um, your contract will indicate the due date for when your application should be submitted. This is generally six months after your contract is signed. Keep in mind that during the per this period, your client relations manager is available to you, as well as the ability to submit interpretations. Thanks, Marinola. Okay. Um, the next question, actually, we're going to talk about our people. We've got, as you can see, we have a great team here. We're spread all across the country. Some of us are in the office today. Diane and Steve are across the country. Um, who are some of these people who support an organization when they go through the accreditation process? So I'll take that question. Um, that, that will be your client relations manager. They will be your first point of contact after the accreditation application agreement has been executed. They will assist you through the process of submitting the acc accreditation application. Once your application has been submitted, you'll be assigned a reviewer who will take the application through the desktop and validation review as well as provide the accreditation decision on your application after it's been reviewed by URAC's accreditation committee. Thanks, Renola. Steve, let's go back to you. We see in here, you can see um, that second red box from the left there, desktop review. Tell me about the desktop review and why it's important. Sure, a desktop review. Uh, this is where um, the URAC team will review and score um, uploaded documentation accompanying your application. Uh, during this phase, we'll end up reviewing the information and uh, provide a score. From that point, um, your organization will be able to identify specific areas that are not met as well as what has been met. And if it's been uh, identified as not met uh, for a specific issue, we'll provide the specific concern as well as a recommendation to meet compliance. Uh, organizations will have an opportunity during this phase to provide an RFI, so it's request for information. Um, and this may go back and forth a couple times until we identify and close out all uh, identified issues. Um, the desktop review will need to be closed out at 100% compliance before we proceed to the next step, which is looking at the validation review. And Steve, why don't you just hang in there and uh, talk to us a little bit of, so we've got the desktop review done, we've scored it. What happens next at the validation review? 
Sure, the validation review is a step where we confirm your day-to-day -day activities are matching and aligned to the policies and procedures that you submitted. Uh, this particular assessment will include looking at interviews, file reviews, documentation review, and for clinical area network, um, this process will take one day um, for two reviewers. Thanks, Steve. So, yes. Diane, it, we know that, I mean, you've done this. If you're a client, you're going through this, you've submitted all of this documentation, you've had us come on site. I, we are returning to on site reviews starting next week. Um, now we're here, and oh my gosh. They've, the reviewers have left and I we have heard clients, I actually had a client say to me, it was kind of the most fun final exam I ever had going through the uh, the validation review. So, but what happens after that? I'm hanging out here, I've done all my work. What happens? That's a great question. So after the validation review, an executive summary is created by the reviewer uh, summarizing those findings. So once the executive summary is created, the application and the executive summary are presented in a blinded fashion. So the uh, accreditation committee does not know who you are, where you're located, um, to URAX accreditation committee, which is made up of volunteers from across the industry. URAX staff uh, facilitates this meeting, but we are not voting members. The accreditation committee meets twice a month. If quorum is met, the accreditation committee will vote on your application. And once the accreditation committee makes that accreditation decision, the point of contact will be notified of the decision. That's a huge relief. Um, that's a, just a huge relief once, once we do. And we try to make that turnaround pretty quickly. I know at least uh, most of the cases I've seen, we're really able to do it definitely within 30 days or so. Uh, we know we like to get those decisions out. We know you're waiting on us. You're waiting with bated breath. And we want to tell you there's some joy. There's a lot of joy on our end in telling you. So, Steve, we do have this six-month period, and it's a long time for people to wait sometimes. Um, but six months is long, but we make it go by easily. What's happening during those six months after submitting the application? Uh, great. Um, the first few months are actually the process of really allotting for the submission and review of the desktop portion of the application. Uh, we'll be walking through the desktop submission through the RFI process and then working towards the validation review. Um, as we get to the last final three months, it completes the validation review, then the presenting of the application to the accreditation committee, uh, and then the accreditation committee providing a decision on your application. Uh, so that's the reason why it takes the six month process. Thanks, Steve. Um, Mornal, if anything, the last year and a half has shown us that healthcare can get thrown for a loop. We may not know quite what to expect. Um, what happens? Things are understandable. Clients may need more time. What happens if a client says they need more time? They're going to start with you as our client relations manager and what's going to happen at that point. Thank you, Lisa. And we do understand that circumstance may arise that may require an extension. We do have an extension process available for a fee if you need more time to submit your application. Great. Thank you. So we've got some frequently asked questions here. Diane, we see some organizations wanting to work with an accreditation consultant. We see some who don't. You've seen it on both sides. What does UREC recommend? And both are successful, Lisa. So it's certainly an option that you can utilize um, as we see many organizations do to partner with uh, an accreditation consultant. However, just as many uh, choose to seek accreditation on their own, both approaches can be successful uh, in achieving accreditation. Uh, just a note that if you're going to work with a consultant, ensure that you make the policies yours and that they fit your organization while maintaining uh, the intent, meeting the intent of the standards. Don't depend solely on the consultant because at the end of the day, you own your policies. And as Steve mentioned, URAC will validate your compliance with the standards at the validation review. Um, and Diane, feel free to feed this one to Sean. As I recall, the any consultants are not allowed, they're not on site when we do our validation review, correct? That is correct. You are correct. Yep. So, so it means that the consultant can help along the way, but really, ultimately, you and your team mm -hmm. need to own it. You need to know, own your policies and procedures and really not just own them, but you need to know them, be able to speak to them, be able to talk about the applicability within the organization. Yes, you're exactly right. So Sean, this next question is for you. 
we know some healthcare organizations want to go big or go home. So say they say a clinically integrated candidate for a clinically integrated network accreditation says, we also want to do telehealth. Um, what do we tell them? Welcome aboard. Uh, you know, when, when we think about these things, there's so many different organizations that we work with. And, and remember that URAC is not just even in the United States, we actually work with clients across the world. And so we've seen all of these different combinations of accreditations and certifications and designations and all those sort of things. So what we would do is we take a look at what you're putting together, what's your mix, what's your, your general thing. But, but you can have a policy that fits for a clinically integrated network and it'd be the same policy for your ACO, or it, you can have those things to where they overlap and, you know, sometimes you can use something for multiple areas and sometimes you can't use it for multiple areas. And we're actually working with our tool set with our AccreditNet uh, set of software to try and make it a little easier so that you don't have to submit the same policy, you know, three places for three different accreditations, but keep it in the library. That's something that we're building. Uh, you just can't buy accreditation software down at Best Buy or Walmart or anything like that. But uh, we, we, when you work with your client relations manager, we get to know your organization. We get to know what you're working on. We can help you to understand, you know, if, if we we know your policies. We could say, you know, you've got this great policy over here for credentialing for your clinically integrated network. You could also use that for your em employer provided population health or employer based population health. So, so we will work with you. You know, our, our team is, is pretty knowledgeable. That's one of the reasons why we employ our reviewers is because we bring the experts to our side of the table so that we're not selling you a bunch of consulting services to where we're, we're, uh, you know, uh, training you for the test that we're going to give you. We think that's a conflict of interest. We really want accreditation not to be checking the boxes or using somebody else's policies, but we really want it to be a quality journey for your organization so that you're taking care of the people that you're wanting to take care of and you're doing it in the best way possible with our nationally and internationally recognized standards. Sean, thanks so much for that. Um, talk to us a little bit more about our team here and, and kind of who they are and the importance of us being in, of us having independent reviewers. Well, well, the the our reviewers are are, are typically employed. If you, if you've worked with a number of other accrediting organizations, sometimes they use volunteers. Sometimes they use their own consultants, independent uh, reviewers, that sort of stuff. We really think that there's a value to having a reviewer who, whether it be in pharmacy, whether it be in clinical integration, whether it be in case management, somebody who's seen a lot of these types of organizations. So if they come into your organization you're not the first time that they have seen this. You know, in, in clinical integration, we all can, can read the FTC guidelines and we can read the, the legal standings and that sort of stuff. That gives you sort of the regulatory threshold, but really the quality threshold is higher than that. And our people bring that kind of clinical experience to the table. We also, not just using the same reviewers over and over again for multiple organizations so that they get to be experts, but we actually compare our reviewers to each other. We don't want your accreditation to be based upon whether the person that you had who did your you was in a good mood or liked you or you happen to know them from some professional organization. We actually do inter-rater reliability statistical analysis as to how our reviewers compare to each other because the, the URAC gold star we believe has value. And if you look around the country, you know, we have government deemed programs, we have government recognized programs, we have employer recognized programs. And that's because we've been doing this for 30 years. We didn't just invent this last week. This is not some sales gimmick. We are nonprofit independent third Third party accreditation organization that, that really wants to work with you to deliver better care in all the areas where you deliver care. Thanks, Sean. Um, Marnell, I want to go back to you. This is an interesting question. So healthcare organizations, they can change ownership. We, I see things in the news about so-and-so was bought out by so-and-so. Um, so does the accreditation transfer if an organization ownership changes ownership? So UREX accreditation is not automatically transferable. If a material change occurs within your organization after you are accredited, including a change in ownership, you will submit a notice of change which can be found in AccreditNet or by contacting the URAC Clients Relations Department who will be happy to assist you. URAC will review the details of the change and consider what, if any, impacts there is to compliance with the standards. Follow-up may require a contract addendum and or a forecast review to confirm the organization's re organization remains compliant with the standards. A change in organization ownership will require a contract addendum and a forecast review. Thanks, Marnell. I appreciate that. So uh, another question back for you. So we rely heavily on an organizational 
point of contact. Um, it is that one person, it's in our credit net system where you're applying, that's the main person there. But we also know people change careers. The world is ever changing. We're in what we're hearing called the great resignation now. So we know teams are changing. What happens if an organization's point of contact changes? Yeah, that's uh, quite easy, actually. Um, all we do ask is that um, the client sends an email to their client relations manager notifying URAC of the change, and your client's relations manager will ensure that the organization's profile is updated with the changes. Thank you. Sean, the question on everybody's mind. We've done all of this work. We've submitted the documents. They've followed up on the request for information. You've had a reviewer come on site. Uh, this is a dicey one, so we hand it over to our CEO here. But what percentage of organizations achieve accreditation the first time through? Well, I, you know, and, and it's a longer answer than people are going to I mean, I could quote you a stat or something like that. It, it varies depending upon the accreditations that we're talking about. I can tell you that your people passing accreditation should not be 100%. And the reason why I say that, because if a test is too easy that everybody's passing it, you have to wonder about, is the test too easy? But it can't be so difficult that everybody fails it because then you're not actually doing a good job of, of helping organizations. In general, over 90% of the organizations who go through the process receive accreditation. And, and remember that this is an educational iterative process where we work with you, where we, we highlight the gaps that you have and those sort of things. Now, if, if you're an organization and let's say you never do primary source verification on credentials, uh, you're gonna have trouble passing a URAC accreditation because that's kind of really important. There are some things that we call mandatory and must haves and we have scores and all that sort of stuff. But the vast majority of organizations when they work Work with us and when they really want to achieve it we help them to get through it at an over 90 percent pass rate is, is a pretty good number to trust awesome um steve do you want to chime in there at all anything like that with there i thought i saw you oh sure uh, as far as the feedback just uh, to continue on what sean was mentioning um that what it, the process in general um i've heard that the process is actually strenuous but the knowledge and experience that's been exchanged between the reviewers other organizations, as well as just the um, the client relations departments, and it's definitely well worth it. Uh, so just seeking the seeking the accreditation. I think um, I'm an educator by train, training, and love. Um, and I one of the parts that makes me really happy to speak to is that we really pride ourselves on our accreditation process being a learning process and being one where we are hoping that you will learn best practices and that you will share best practices. That helps us actually be better as a healthcare community at large. Sean, I see you nodding along, so hopefully I'm, I'm hitting the no, nail no, there. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I, I think that one of the things, you know, we've seen organizations try and go through accreditation and check the boxes and not actually practice what they say they're going to do. They're not going to do well because we check your work. We've also seen organizations that have taken this like somebody getting ready for the Olympics. You know, they're going into training and they're going to get in shape and they're going to be ready for it. And when that time comes, they're going to be good and not just good for a day because accreditation is not being in perfect shape for the moment of the test. It's about changing your organization so that you take care of all of your patients all of the time in the right way. And that's really what we want to work with, uh, with organizations that go through this. And that's why we, we occasionally will do a monitoring review, or if there's a cause of concern, we will go check things. You know, more Nola's answer about changing in ownership. You know, if changing in ownership just means, oh, wait, we got a different name at the top of our org chart, that's kind of a minor change. But if it's, uh, oh, we completely changed everything, and now we do credentialing you know, in uh, in some other place where it wasn't before, you know, we're going to have to check that out to make sure that you're still meeting the standards. And so I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's a little surprising. I, I always thought of accreditation as being the, we have meetings for six months and we take all the boxes off of the top shelf and we give everybody a little badge that tells them where the fire extinguisher is and all that sort of stuff. And then we have the accreditation visit. And then after everybody leaves, we go, yay, they're gone. And we get rid of our badges and we put the boxes back up. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're actually trying to uh, uh, help an organization to have a culture of quality to where you're doing things better at the end and not just different for the moment. And that, that's what really accreditation should be. It should be that, you know, you know, you've met the standard, we know you've met the standard and everybody can rely on the fact that you have the URAC gold star in how you do business. Thank you. 
So, Warren, all of this question goes back to you. How long does the accreditation last? When I'm a, it, we like to say that you're always preparing for accreditation, but you're always prepared for it as well. But let's talk about how long it lasts, and then the reaccreditation process, because that starts on your end. Yes. So the accreditation decisions are, are for three years. Um, but the uh, re-accreditation process is very similar to the initial accreditation process that we explained earlier. The key difference is what URAC calls the index date. With a re-accreditation, compliance to the standards is required from the beginning of your accreditation cycle. It is important to note that between an initial and re-accreditation, there may be changes to the version of the standards. The organization should make necessary changes to processes based on the standard revisions. Where there are changes to the standards, compliance is measured from the date the application is submitted for reaccreditation. Thank you. Um, Sean, an organization has made it this far. They are accredited. We have given them their seal. But then, I mean, you've, you've been in this. You, are, you have worked in clinically integrated networks. What are you going to tell your peers to do once they've been accredited? Well, I, I think that when you go through accreditation, and Lisa's laughing at me because I've used some funny analogies in the past about getting accredited. Uh, my, my latest analogy is that when you get your information about becoming accredited, it should look like the celebration party we saw for the Olympian Lydia Jacoby up in Seward, <laughs> Alaska. You know, the crowd went nuts. And that's what we want you to do as an organization because you've achieved it. You, you've reached the pinnacle. But then you should be using this in your advertising, communicating with employers. You should be uh, talking to your, your local media about accreditation. This is a chance to highlight the work that you've done and distinguish yourself in the marketplace. And, and I think that, you know, all of your doctors should have a, have a little insignia for, for being an accredited clinically integrated network and, and you should be celebrating it and it should be on your logos and your websites and your letterheads and all those sort of things. Because what you have done is you have said, I'm not just meeting the bare minimum to, to qualify. I've actually stepped up and somebody has checked my work. And that's, that's the value of accreditation. And that's, that's what people uh, work so hard to achieve. And you should be proud of it and you should be highlighting it and, and we will help you highlight it you know we will congratulate you on linkedin we will help you with press releases we will give you verbiage so that you can communicate your accomplishment and it's it's just really exciting to to work with organizations when they have come through it and and we've, we've talked before about you know it's, it's very common for us to hear you know thank you for helping us to be a better organization and that's what accreditation should do it shouldn't be a pop quiz where we're trying to trick you Oh my goodness, look, there's a slide. Eva. There is a slide. <laughs> there is a slide of there. Um, I love it because at the end, when I'm done facilitating webinars, I also get to work with clients and hear their stories and hear them tell us, yeah, I really loved having my reviewer on site because he or she saw things that I might not have seen or they showed me something from another organization. Um, I think that's one of the strengths and we are always happy to work with you. So once you get accredited, it's about a month after and we get you up on social media you'll see it on LinkedIn. We want you to put that seal on your website. That's a huge importance. And to be honest, I'll say now as a patient, when I'm going to look at something, I'm like, oh, do you, are, you, are you accredited? And by whom are you accredited? And we'll, we'll see. I think that means something. Steve, I can see that you want to chime in there too. You know, just the same thing as I mentioned before, the feedback for releasing of the information. It's just that organizations just are happy with the types of information they receive. So just looking at the exchange and the knowledge that we have provided as an organization, as well as the, the industry as a whole, being able to share that back with them, um, they feel more comfortable uh, moving forward. And during the reaccreditation process, it's essentially the same thing, just get it gathered more information as they're already comfortable with the standards. Um, Sean or Steve, I'm going to ask you, it's, Sean, why don't you start with this one? Steve, if you want, you can chime in. What does a clinically integrated network accreditation do for a community? What does it, what does it mean for the health, for the larger health of a community? How does it help? Well, back in my past when I was part of a clinically integrated network, you know, getting doctors together, a clinically integrated network is supposed to be uh, an alignment of physicians and, and providers to where they are working on quality improvement initiatives. And because they do that, they can then contract together. Some organizations have approached it as, oh, we want to contract together, therefore we better do some quality things. And that's kind of a little bit backwards. It's really about allowing uh, providers to work together to raise the quality of the care that they deliver to let 
them, you know, share resources that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do, especially independent providers. And it's saying that the benefits of this quality work are enough that we're not going to be as concerned about about monopoly risks or or those sort of things. And the FTC created this because they said quality patient care and improving quality patient care is worth it enough to where we're going to let people contract together so that they can can provide that benefit to a community. So so as you go through this and as you achieve it, you know, my organization actually originally sat down with the FTC to sort of go through and make sure that we had checked all the boxes and we're doing the right things. Your organization can go through accreditation and make sure that you're checking all the boxes and doing the right things so that you set up your program correctly. And that lessens your risk as an organization. That shows that you're kind of in compliance um, when, when you go through this. And we've checked to make sure you're doing it right. And and to be able to do that with, a, with an independent third party organization with trained reviewers, as opposed to the federal government coming in and investigating your organization is a pretty nice thing at the end of the day. Absolutely. Steve, you want to chime in? Wanna... Sure. I'll just add one other uh, quick comment to that. It's looking at, um, as Sean mentioned, Dr. Griffin mentioned, looking at the total population health. It's also allowing the providers um, to compare how they're competing against other, other peers. Um, so this is an opportunity for improvement, not just looking at one particular provider improving, but as, as a whole, um, when they're able to communicate and um, be transparent. Diane, you haven't chimed in a while. What is what I'm going to ask you from the reviewer side? What's the best part of seeing clients go through this? And I realize this is not a, this is an answer that you're just going to do from the heart because you know it from the heart better than anything. I think it's celebrating their success um, because this is a strenuous process, as has already been mentioned, um, and. You know, one thing that I hear from applicants is they feel that UREC supports them through that process. No, we're not their consultants, um, but we're here to ask questions, to provide information, to provide clarification in the many ways we've talked about today. So I think um, that support, um, you know, really is, is an important key aspect to applicants. And I hear that over and over. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'd love to have any final questions from the audience. You've seen Nick has chimed in with our YouTube channel. You can see some testimonials from our clients there. You can see other webinars. You can see some of our thought leadership pieces there. Um, we post on LinkedIn probably a good maybe once a day minimum with either a congratulations or an article. Um, we get our Twitter posts up there. Um, if any of your colleagues are going to be at any of the upcoming conferences this uh, this summer, Sean's going to be presenting at HIMSS, will be a presence at NASP and at Assembia. If any of your pharmacy colleagues will be there, we'll have a booth there. Um, oh, great question here, Sean, for you. Um, any changes forthcoming based on our alignment with DNV? So for those who don't know, we had a webinar with the DNV about a month ago or so, um, and we kind of showed our new partnership with them. But Sean, any, do you envision any changes coming forward? Well, I, I think there's a couple things. I mean, num number one, DNV is a, is a quality organization, and they do some really nice work. And we're a quality organization. We do some really nice work. We're, we're not overly competitive with one another. So we believe that there are opportunities for us to work together. More on that to come. But I, I think that, you know, quality is not just the, you know, there, there's no monopoly on quality. You know, there, there are good accreditors. There are, are other organizations that are a little less good at accreditation, but working with other good quality organizations to do better work, it's it's looking for places where you align. I think that you'll, you'll be seeing us work together more in the future. You're, I think you're going to be seeing some alignment between some of our standards and some of our philosophies. There's things that, that we do that align with what they do. There's things that they do that align with what we do. And we're not really in competition. So I think I think that, that us working with them, you're going to see more of those things to where maybe um, for us, you might see to where we are incorporated into some of their standards, where if you're meeting URAC accreditation for this thing, they will count that as being good enough for their standards. And we'll probably do the same with them. Um, you know, clinical integration is an area that they don't offer anything in. And I, I think that you could say that our programs, if you look at them and you're familiar with DNV, you'll see alignment with our, the way we structure things and the, the way that we uh, do things. So I, I just think that, that um, 
um, you know, working with other good organizations and not acting like everybody has to be UREC accredited in everything when there's things we don't do is just a sign of how we're, we're working together to put patients first. And, and we work with organizations to put patients first. And it's not to cut everybody else out of the market. We believe competition is actually, actually a good thing in accreditations because if there's only one organization doing an accreditation, they generally get a little slow, lazy, and expensive. And so we think competition is good for us and it's good for, for other organizations. You won't hear that from every accreditor. They like to monopolize things. Um, but we're going to be there and we're going to work with organizations that want to work with us as long as it benefits patients. So, um, Sean, I, I think you just closed it out for us perfectly. Of uh, there's, there's no competition for how much quality there can be in healthcare. We can always be working together um, to improve healthcare, to provide better service to patients, to providers, to payers, um, to make processes more seamless. And that's what we do here. So you can see Nick timed in the link to our webinar with DMV that we did that was with Sean and Patrick Kareen, who was is their uh, seat president and CEO as well. They're talking about quality and what it means for healthcare. Um, if you'd like more information, you can call or email us. Uh, Kurt Acker is on here. He's your sales rep in this um, area. So please, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you being here with us. Without seeing any further questions, we're going to conclude today's webinar. But as always, be in touch. And we'll send out the recording to this webinar um, probably by the end of the week. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.